We'll just give a minute or two as we allow everyone to join in here. Um, we'll be getting started in about one minute's time. So just want to welcome everyone here. So we'll keep admitting now. Okay, perhaps we'll get started then. Good afternoon, everyone. I just would like to welcome everyone for today's OC3PR webinar uh, presented again by Critical Care Services Ontario. Our OC3PR series is there to help critical care health professionals better care for critically ill patients. Our obvious focus of late has been on helping teams care for patients with COVID-19. As always, we invite you to send in your suggestions to the email address at info at ccso.ca. Just so you know, we've used your suggestions and value your feedback immensely. So please take the time to complete the survey after each webinar, including today. Uh, we again invite you to send in questions to the Q&A uh, address uh, during today's webinar. Uh, it will be Jose Terrio, who's going to be taking your questions and fielding them and then presenting them to our speakers. We do this after every webinar. Uh, so please uh, feel free to submit your questions uh, now and even in, in advance at times. We invite you to follow CCSO on Twitter as well as subscribe to their YouTube channel where you can see all of our previous webinars. And also we encourage you to check out the new CCSO website. Finally, for today's presentation, we ask that you keep yourself muted as best as possible. Today, we're gonna to be having our first webinar for 2021, a year I think all of us only hope will be much better than 2020, a year so bad they named it twice. I think, however, it's safe to say that the next 48 weeks um, will likely bring Ontario its greatest challenges that we will experience with COVID pandemic. It's likely inevitable that many of the sites in Ontario will be challenged with higher patient volumes, be asked to care for sicker patients in a novel fashion in locations, and will likely see the need to create new clinical practices and approaches to providing care. With those caveats, it's actually fortuitous that today we'll be hearing from the team in Scarborough, who are part of the Scarborough Health Network. Many of you may not be aware, but the Scarborough Health Network has managed more COVID critically ill patients than any other group in Ontario, with well over 250 patients being cared for at their three sites. They had some of the first COVID patients in Ontario and have changed how they deliver care in their ICUs accordingly, but also they've changed how they deliver care in the medical wards that we'll hear about. I think we can all learn from their experiences and at the end of it, you'll agree with me that they're the real HN in Ontario now. Today, we welcome Ms. Zelina Kassam and Dr. Marty Betts. Ms. Kassam is presently the patient care manager for the Critical Care Program, Scarborough Health Network General Site. Previous to that, she was the clinical manager of the ICU at Umber River uh, Hospital. Clearly, she seems to be drawn to hospitals that have high COVID burdens, um, and so we'll hear from her experience. She received her nursing degree from Ryerson University and her Master of Nursing Administration from the University of Toronto. She's worked at Sunnybrook and Trillium Health Partners, as well as led many organizational initiatives, including uh, starting a chronic vent program, establishing criteria for admission to reactivation centers, and creating innovative staffing models. Her interest is quality and process improvement. Dr. Martin Betts is the Medical Director of the Critical Care Program and Chief of the Department of Critical Care at the Scarborough Health Network. He's a lecturer for the University of Toronto. He completed his internal medicine training and critical care medicine training at the University of Toronto. He's been practicing at Scarborough Hospital for well over five years. To help us guide us through today's talk, I'll be passing it over to Dr. Mike Sullivan. Mike is a distinguished anesthesiologist and intensivist who's certainly been instrumental in getting OC through PR up and running, as well as been a leader in Ontario's response to COVID-19 as an Ontario regional lead, as well as several uh, other important roles. 
I know he shares my admiration for the Scarborough team and uh, I'll pass it over to you, Mike, and we'll share responsibilities here. Thanks very much, Dave. And uh, a big welcome to uh, Zelina and Marty. Uh, we're really grateful that you were able to take enough time out of your uh, uh, busy schedules to be able to uh, share your experience. And we've got a lot to be kind of to celebrate uh, in, in the great work that you've done. I wonder if you could start us off by just by uh, telling us about the community of Scarborough and the Scarborough Health Network to kind of situate us in your place. Uh, Zelina, I think you're going to start off. Sure. Thanks. Um, so Scarborough is home to about 650,000 people. And uh, they do, we do have uh, people from a very diverse multi-ethnic population, generally who don't access healthcare on a regular basis. Um, next slide. So Scarborough Health Network was formed about four years ago uh, with the amalgamation of the Grace site, uh, which is the Birchmount campus, the uh, Rouge Valley Centenary site, and the general site. Um, at the Birchmount site, we have 15 level three beds that are split between the second and the third floor of the building. And they do have an RN led uh, CCRT program. At the centenary site, we up until the fall, we had 18 ICU level three beds and we've expanded to another two for a total of 20 L3 beds. We've opened up a new 10 bed um, high respiratory unit as well as we have a 10 bed coronary care unit as well. Um, and we are supported by the regional, uh, we support the regional cardiac program and we are um, an CCRT RN led model at that site. The general site is um, our oldest site. It was built around the 1950s. Uh, we do have 29 uh, level three ICU beds of which uh, six are acute surgical beds and 23 are level three beds. Uh, in the fall, we, are, we looked towards opening eight CP3 satellite uh, beds uh, to support uh, the unit and its needs. Uh, we do have an MDRN operated CCRT program. Um, we were one of the first hospitals to have a, an in-house ICU physicians 24 seven. And we're proud to say that we continue that model till today. Um, we support regional programs in dialysis, vascular surgery and spine surgery. Next slide. Next slide. So Selena, we'll get you to introduce Sorry. you. That's okay, we'll get you to introduce <laughs> your team. It was just me coming off mute. Okay. So uh, between the three sites, uh, we do have uh, approximately 230 full-time uh, ICU RNs. Uh, we do have about 50 part-time uh, casual RNs as well. We have 32 full-time uh, respiratory therapists and about seven part-time casual uh, respiratory therapists. We do have a um, robust allied team that consists of physiotherapists, uh, social worker, dietitian, um, and uh, uh, physiotherapy assistants as well. Next slide. And we do have 18 uh, critical care uh, intensivists uh, that rotate between the three sites. Um, next slide. It, it looks like your team is having a lot of fun there, uh, Zelina. Um, we are, we do. <laughs> um, Marty, maybe I'll get you to get the next question here. And can you just describe for us your, uh, your COVID-19 experience? Sure thing, and thanks for inviting us uh, to present today, Mike. Um, uh, for SHN, uh, we have a long history of coronavirus, and, and I'm gonna explain it to you in uh, using OC3P uh, analogy and tradition of a, a Star Wars theme, um, uh, where the original coronavirus really started in 2003. And, and for many of us, uh, you know, I, I wasn't around at that time, uh, but it certainly has had a major um, a bearing on our organization uh, and how it grew in the, in the time thereafter. For instance, the respiratory unit we'll talk about at our centenary site was built uh, with negative pressure rooms on the eighth floor because of uh, SARS-1 in 2003. And, and it's actually given us uh, an opportunity for this pandemic. Um, but uh, 
you know, many would know that our Grace, what was the Grace site, now our Scarborough Birchmont Hospital was the uh, the first place in Canada that SARS uh, was originally identified in 2003 and played a major impact in in that uh, epidemic. And, and certainly it's had a major influence on um, our staff. So many of our physicians and nurses and respiratory therapists were around in 2003 when when SARS showed up on our door. And, and you know, certainly I uh, recall the generation of critical care physicians prior to me uh, where SARS-1 really defined their career to a, to a significant degree. Uh, and so when we heard in January of last year that a, there, there was an, um, a novel coronavirus outbreak, we knew in some ways that Scarborough would be involved to, some, to, to a significant degree. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it brought up painful memories and, and really apprehension uh, and concern uh, for what, what was in 2003 that, that could become in 2020. Uh, so the coronavirus strikes back, uh, and um, uh, and uh, much like other organizations, uh, Wave One uh, was a really challenging time for us. I mean, I think we look back on those months in the spring uh, with a lot of different emotions, and in some respects, we've over we overcame a whole lot. Uh, in the top panel, we really had to adapt the way we incorporate families into the way we care for patients, and that for our staff and our physicians was a, a major. Uh, a change uh, from how we're used to operating. And, and we know, in fact, for our patients, it was a major change. So uh, using technology to bring uh, uh, patients and families into the ICU. On March 15th, uh, as Dave mentioned, uh, my colleague, Dr. Kevin Shore at the Centenary site, we believe intubated the first uh, COVID-19 patient uh, in Ontario. And a couple hours later, he did the second. So we found from the very beginning uh, in wave one, we experienced a relatively high burden of, of SARS coronavirus in our organization and in our community. Uh, I think as healthcare workers, uh, there's never been a time where we've been uh, more celebrated, whether it was uh, first responders parading through uh, the streets. Um, certainly our community group stepped up with surgical caps. Uh, you know, every meal was almost taken care of by some of our community organizations. And it really was a time that um, you know, really felt, uh, as we still do, uh, valued by our, our community. And, and, you know, a lot of us, after we got over the hump of April, getting comfortable with this, uh, got, you know, reasonably comfortable with PPE, reasonably comfortable with the approach to patients, and that has continued us and, and stood us well through uh, the second wave. Uh, and so after a relatively uh, dormant and, and, and quiet summer months, uh, the fall certainly has seen the return of the coronavirus uh, and, uh, and wave two. So um, I actually pulled a slide from Facebook, uh, where a colleague, uh, 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 pulled um, uh, some data that uh, one of the Toronto analytics tables had put together. So this is, um, the slide describes uh, uh, COVID-19 activity um, uh, inpatient days and in ICU days uh, across the top 40 hospitals in the province. And uh, you can see where we rank. Now I, I will uh, give extra credit to uh, some of the other multi-site organizations uh, that had their sites broken up into two that uh, if you added them together would be approaching the activity that we've had. So certainly our folks at, um, at Osler and Trillium, I know, uh, and, and other places have been nearly as, as busy as we have. And it's really continued. This, this data describes November to December, but you know, even going back to Thanksgiving, uh, we were uh, exceptionally busy. At one time, I think uh, we had 30% of the vented COVID volume in Ontario, uh, and it's developed a, uh, an internal database describing our activity uh, and uh, try and update it every day. So uh, as of midnight last night, uh, we cared for 284 separate patients uh, admissions to our ICUs with COVID-19 uh, since wave one. I can tell you that just since this morning, that number is at least four or five higher, uh, having written the orders myself for a few of the patients. Uh, the patients have been distributed between all of our, all three of our sites. In fact, as a multi-site uh, organization, we've been using all three sites in a sort of a, a mini regional network to uh, try and balance the load and make sure that we can continue health services, all health services for our community that way. Uh, th but through it all, uh, tragically, we've had 75 deaths of the patients in our, in our ICU. Uh, the chart on the bottom gives really the, 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 the pattern of when these admissions have come. Uh, we you know, had a real strong peak in uh, late March and early April, and then things sort of tapered off through uh, May and into June. And then again, they, they picked up uh, late September and have continued uh, and even become more aggressive as, as most of you have experienced as well through uh, the late fall and into the winter. Uh, for what it's worth, the, uh, the average age of the patients that we've admitted has been 66, and uh, roughly two thirds of them, in fact, exactly two thirds of them have been male. 
Uh, we were able to, over the summer, uh, pull some of the data from our database to just describe the outcomes of these patients. So overall, patients admitted to our ICU uh, experienced 27% mortality, which uh, given the reports in the early spring coming out of Italy and New York and whatever else we, we thought is uh, quite good. Um, and um, in particular, when we've broken the data down by age, we recognize patients that under the age of 75 admitted to our ICU, which would be the by far the most common and represent about 80% of them. Uh, the mortality rate for those individuals has been 17%. And it's a number that we're, we're, we're really proud of in, uh, uh, in our organization and I think reflects the work of uh, all of our, our teams that have put, uh, put all these efforts into helping support patients. Marty, that's just, uh, just great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure people are going to have lots of questions, and I want to remind you that if you do have questions, then uh, you can go ahead and type them into Q&A uh, on the Zoom chat. And, uh, and also, if you want, you can use the chat on the, uh, if you're tuning in by YouTube, you can use the chat there to um, uh, forward your questions, and we'll have a chance to be able to, to get them to both Marty and Zelina. Um, but just before we get there, what do you think are the most important things that the two of you would like to share about your experience at Scarborough and, and to share that with the audience from a clinical and administrative uh, perspective? So Mindy, do you want to start us off? Or Marty? So, you know, um, uh, you know, the major uh, organ manifestation of COVID-19 has been uh, acute lung injury and ARDS. And so it's really forced us to re-reflect on how we manage patients with this condition and, uh, and brush up on how we do so. Um, you know, starting with intubation and, and for many of us, uh, protected intubation is a, a new concept. And even for many of our physicians, a rapid sequence intubation, which has been the recommended type was something to develop. And so it's something that, we, that uh, 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 many of us have worked on, but also recognize that for some of our physicians, it's not their traditional way of intubating and, and they've continued doing um, uh, you know, moderate sedation without paralysis uh, and have done so very successfully and without any uh, adverse consequences or, or significant, or any actually I should say, uh, transmission of virus as part of that AGMP. Uh, we've reflected a lot uh, regarding the role of non-invasive respiratory supports. Uh, certainly in Italy, they've had a lot of experience with NIV helmets and it's something that we are uh, looking into, uh, but haven't had access to, to uh, uh, easily enough to sort of uh, deploy. Uh, but we've really relied on high flow nasal cannula and high flow therapies as a, uh, an adjunct support for patients. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about our strategy and, uh, and the opportunity for that that we've used in our organization for that. Um, we have a lot of discussion internally about the timing of intubation. The little panel I put up on the top right really reflects our general sort of uh, approach to this very early in the pandemic, I think based upon the experience um, or the poor experience in other coronavirus uh, epidemics with non-invasive supports that we were uh, intubating very early in illness. So once someone really exceeded five liters of oxygen, uh, we would bring them to a negative pressure room and often secure the airway. Um, uh, and then we learned that, you know, patients could tolerate really quite significant degrees of hypoxemia uh, and that potentially avoiding intubation uh, uh, and, and patients that you, where you could uh, would be helpful. And so for a very long period of the pandemic, uh, we would tolerate oxygen saturations of you know, high 80 and low 90% as long as uh, with patients on a combination of a Tavish mask and a high flow nasal cannula. I think more recently we reflected uh, and we're sort of balancing out at um, uh, invasive ventilation slightly earlier than we had in others. And so rather than having to rescue someone uh, uh, in the middle of the night, uh, uh, having uh, a slightly earlier approach than we did in the past, but, but not to the degree that we did in the, in the early spring. Uh, we focused a lot uh, in, the, in the months of March on uh, the way we approach the management of ARDS. Uh, we have a few in our group that really I'd be called local experts in respiratory mechanics. Uh, and so uh, they've made themselves available either in person or virtually to help support all our patients across all the sites when there's either challenging uh, ventilatory situations or even just um, providing routine uh, standardized care. Uh, we certainly have benefited from the work of the Toronto Center for Excellence in Mechanical Ventilation out of St. Michael's Hospital. And uh, I think uh, our group would account for many of the YouTube hits on their airway occlusion uh, videos and techniques. And those have certainly been things that we've utilized uh, across all our three sites in, in helping um, identify lung recruitment and, and, and setting PEEP. Um, you know, we've all recognized that uh, 
you know, most of the care we're providing to these patients is supportive, and therefore the, the primary evidence-based therapy would be uh, lung protective ventilation. Uh, we've developed a uh, and rapidly deployed a standardized order set for all ARDS uh, care, whether it's COVID or not, uh, which has really served us well and helped us standardize our approach to this condition. I will say what we've experienced in wave two, and I'm not sure if this relates to the, uh, you know, the provision of steroids more commonly. We see a lot more patients uh, in their second week of illness that have really significant low compliance, or they may have uh, really high driving pressures and plateau pressures on modest doses of PEEP, and, um, and actually finding that uh, providing a relatively low PEEP strategy has is, is, is got pressures in, uh, into more safe ranges for ventilation. And that's been an experience that uh, we didn't really have in wave one where uh, most patients had relatively compliant lungs. And that could have been reflected in the, the timing of intubation as well. Uh, for managing refractory hypoxemia, uh, we certainly have uh, relied heavily on uh, folks at Toronto General for ECLS referrals. Uh, I was on at our Birchmount site uh, just four or five weeks ago, and I think over one weekend we referred five separate patients for ECLS. And, uh, uh, they've been uh, really fantastic at helping uh, uh, assess our patients and also helping support us. Um, and I probably shouldn't have put this as a management of refractory hypoxemia because we certainly do we certainly do use prone position ventilation for refractory hypoxemia. But but really, I think for for us, it used to be uh, a, a rescue maneuver. But we've recognized that for anyone with moderate ARDS, this really is a helpful, uh, safe uh, way of providing ventilatory care. And it's become a standard uh, of ours uh, as part of this pandemic, and we've become really quite effective and efficient at it. And I'm just going to spend a minute describing our approach to uh, how we do that. Uh, so we've been using prone positioning for both intubated and non-intubated patients, the so quote unquote uh, auto proning. And in fact, I've developed an auto proning sheet that we have uh, for all our nursing units and in our ICU to help the nurses track the different positions patients are. Um, uh, doing themselves uh, and, and actually as a visual guide for the patients to, uh, to help with it. Um, we, as mentioned, uh, rather than using this for uh, exclusively refractory hypoxemia, I've been using it for anyone with uh, moderate severe ARDS with a PF ratio less than 150 and are you know, quite strict at, uh, at utilizing this. As a result, we're proning you know, lots and lots of patients. And I think a record in one day in one ICU was proning six patients uh, at one time. We find that most experience improvements in oxygenation, uh, even if they don't, we persist anyways, because we're uh, convinced that there are um, uh, lung protective effects of being in the prone position that are helpful, that will only manifest down the road. And I think the literature would support that. Uh, and we've learned that almost always there's some change in the ventilator settings you'll make afterwards. So we usually get a gas at 30 or 60 minutes and, and, and as physicians are key to hang around with the respiratory therapist to make sure that when someone's moving from prone to, to supine or vice versa, that we're around to help support that. Uh, so the picture on the bottom is actually taken this morning in our general site ICU. That's uh, our team of uh, personal support workers, nurses, physicians, and RT. Uh, we usually have uh, five of us uh, help support the proning um, uh, procedure. And we've got an extra body in there because they really wanted to be in the picture. Um, so I'll... Uh, Took a quick video. This is a patient's actually in the prone position. Uh, what I'll, I'll mention is we learned pretty quickly that uh, it's easier to do a fair number of these as, at once rather than having them scattered through the room. We know that uh, you know longer periods of being in a prone position tend to be uh, more effective. Uh, so at our sites, we try and get patients onto a schedule of uh, flipping prone uh, around the time of sign out uh, between five and six p.m., which allows them to maintain the prone position overnight. And then uh, once rounds are started, uh, the, the subsequent morning gives an opportunity to, to flip them back in supine position, uh, do any investigations or other procedures while there's more staff during the daytime. And that's worked quite well for us. And so patients that sort of uh, come in and need to be proned outside of that schedule, we try and transition them onto that schedule pretty quickly because it seems to be most efficient. Um, so here's a team. Uh, we use a two sheet technique, uh, rolled at the sides, uh, transition the patient to the side of the bed, up to 90 degrees, uh, when everything is safe, uh, back onto their back. And um, we've done this, uh, I haven't had any tube dislodgements. Um, you could probably hear part of it, but the uh, all the timing is based upon a respiratory therapist at the head of the bed uh, who's securing the tube. Uh, and you may not be able to see this in the video, but this patient was actually on uh, continuous renal replacement therapy at the same time, and that therapy was uninterrupted. Uh, and so uh, we, you know, this is a, a uh, couple times a day exercise that, um, that we do. 
I'll speak a little bit to our approach to supportive therapies. Um, I think one uh, really positive for organization is that we've, um, the first time in our ICU, we've been actively involved in enrolling patients in clinical trials. Uh, this has been really nice because it, it's, it's our, uh, you know, the promise we keep to our patients about making sure they get really state-of-the-art care, I think we can sort of guarantee by enrolling them in clinical trials. So to date, uh, my understanding is that we've been, uh, if not the top site, one of the top sites at enrolling patients with the CONCOR-1 trial, which is a trial of therapeutic um, plasma. Uh, and uh, as, since this fall, I've been enrolling patients in the CATCO study as well. We've had lots and lots of internal discussions about the role of anticoagulation. And while I recognize that the, uh, the clinical trials of full dose anticoagulation have stopped for futility, uh, we certainly have seen, uh, you know, to our uh, eyes, uh, higher rates of thrombosis, whether it's in the leg veins, uh, PEs that tend to be small volume, not the massive PE that we sort of fear that causes severe RV failure. They tend to be in smaller segmental and subsegmental branches. And we have had a number of patients with, with uh, quite frankly, horrible multi-territorial cerebral uh, infarcts and strokes. I, I do know that the Ottawa group is doing a trial of half-dose uh, anoxaparin uh, anticoagulation that uh, hopefully gives some information on soon. Uh, in our approach uh, for selected patients that uh, has been to use uh, a dose of daltoparin, we use daltoparin in our ICU, um, uh, twice the prophylaxis dose, so 5,000 BID, and selected patients that appear to have increased risk of thrombosis. They may have extremely high D-dimer levels, et cetera. And secondly, we're quite aggressive at looking for indications to give full dose anticoagulation. So runs of atrial fibrillation, uh, you know, active scanning of the legs for clots, uh, et cetera. Uh, we have struggled at times uh, to sort of have an approach to some of the low quality evidence, potentially low harm supplements. It, you know, I think that there's uh, maybe a role for vitamin D at some point. The fact that there's been no clinical trials is sort of uh, um, not concerning, or, well, would have been helpful. Uh, and I think for the most part, we've rejected some of these uh, metabolic cocktails that have been promoted across uh, different areas of the internet. And I think the biggest one for us has been the role of immunosuppression. Uh, you know, really the question, we know dexamethasone, uh, six milligrams for 10 days has, uh, through the recovery trial, has a decent evidence base, but the question is how much and how long. Uh, and so um, uh, what I'll present to you here is a, a, an actual image of a CT scan that I pulled from a patient I was carrying for last week. Uh, he was about two and a half weeks into his uh, uh, illness with COVID-19, had been on a ventilator for seven to 10 days. And he had really you know, quite, quite uh, profound hypoxemia. And uh, as the CT shows, extensive ground glass. Um, in the middle panel, we've trended his CRP values from the time he was admitted and started his dexamethasone. So they originally peaked on the 1st of January and uh, started to taper. Uh, this CT was done on January the 6th. Uh, and uh, over time, once the steroids were stopped, we found actually a rebound in his CRP values and a worsening of his hypoxemia. Uh, so we elected to treat this patient uh, with uh, an extended dose of effective solumedrol. Uh, and uh, while the, the COVID-19 evidence base sort of uh, starts and stops with the, the recovery trial data with, with dexamethasone, there certainly is literature, and I know Eddie, Eddie Fan described some of this at his, his talk uh, with the dexa ARCH trial, where they use a higher dose, much higher dose of dexamethasone than, than we've been using for COVID. And if we're making the claim this is ARDS, well, that's a decent ARDS literature. And certainly there's been lots of talk um, about the Maduri trial, which uh, you know, came out 22 years ago, where they used really um, uh, high doses, up to two mg per kg of solumedrol, and even infuse it for up to 28 days, uh, with uh, significant improvements in, um, in ventilator outcomes and mortality. So our approach in some of these patients uh, would be to rule out infection, uh, get some lung imaging, and, and consider extending either dexamethasone or using a Maduri type approach uh, to uh, further immunosuppression. And I think the um, the remap cap data, which I know will be presented shortly, uh, really supports the notion of there's a role potentially for more aggressive immunosuppression uh, through tocilizumab and IL-6 inhibition. And so I think there'll be more to come on that uh, as we learn more about this illness. So as we noticed the need for um, more ICU beds, one of the things we started doing as an organization was looking into non-conventional spaces to see how we can create capacity for, um, for more ICU patients. So what we did is we went through opening up an eight bed um, satellite unit at the general site. Uh, we worked with a stage progression from lower acuity to a higher acuity, and we're still working on that piece. 
um, it is really uh, collaborating with the surgical team to um, create a pool of staff that can support the ICU team um, in enrolling and engaging in this space. Um, we've had to have clear role identities and uh, we've been a very engaged team all the way from the directors, managers, uh, CPLs and staff. Um, we, uh, we've worked through uh, a resource kit, a resource toolkit. Uh, we're working on daily structured debriefs, leadership rounding opportunities and educational sessions just to ensure that we are working towards a team-based model and to make sure that the staff and the patients are supported. Uh, next slide, please. At the centenary site, we've taken a little bit of a different approach. We have partnered with the medical team on the eighth floor and we have secured 10 beds for our high acuity respiratory unit. Um, and the model of care in this space would be, the care would still be um, taken by taken over by the um, medical nurses and uh, the ICU nurse would be there to support um, all the uh, patients that are part of the high acuity respiratory unit. Next slide. I'll speak a little bit about the strategy we use as an organization to maintain ICU capacity. Uh, as mentioned, as Lena mentioned, if you add up all the beds, we have an operation, we have 90 critical care beds uh, uh, working today, which is about 20% more than we had uh, this time last spring. Uh, as a multi-site institution, even if uh, there are beds at one particular site, we've elected to pursue our surge activities at all three sites because we recognize that um, uh, our needs are going to come uh, shortly and, and by being efficient at discharges um, uh, and, and other surge activities. Uh, we can create capacity even bef before it's needed. Uh, some part of that is we have a very well developed through our data analytics team, a dashboard that's updated at least hourly. In the top right panel we get, this is just a small snapshot of but the part that I pay the most attention to um, is our uh, uh, assessment center positivity rate. You can see it's been running in the 25% range since Christmas, which is, I'll tell you, scary. Uh, in October, November, we were in the sort of 10 to 15% range. So this is substantially higher than we were experiencing before. Uh, it gives an idea of the number of patients we have with COVID and, and also how many have been admitted in the last day. And, and I actually find it's the, the number of newly admitted COVID patients by site uh, by that day that really predicts where the next stresses are going to become. And so we, we shift patients site to site as a, a really an internal regional type program to create capacity at each site. And when we see the numbers uh, relatively imbalanced on the medical units by site, um, uh, we know we'll need critical care capacity at, at, at that corresponding site very shortly. And lastly, we've uh, moved to having a single point of oversight for all the uh, critical care beds near the corporation. That includes our CCU beds. Uh, so we have an understanding of who's coming, who's going, and, and where they're moving to. And we have all beds uh, optimally utilized. I don't want to overlook the uh, the impact of COVID on long-term care. And, uh, you know, in, in fact, that we've had uh, a number of nursing homes quite publicly, actually, in our community that have been uh, excessively impacted. So the Rockcliffe Nursing Home is really right across the street from me. Over 90% of their residents were impacted and uh, uh, infected with COVID. And certainly the Tender Care Nursing Home, which is just adjacent to our Birchmount site, has been in the news uh, all too often. But I think in part because of the aggressive approach our organization took to helping support those long-term care facilities, not just with IPAC guidance, but actually having physicians from our hospital go into, into those homes to provide medical care, whether it was IV fluids, dexamethasone, uh, but importantly, also counseling uh, families and patients on, um, uh, and providing end-of-life care really meant that uh, the impact to our ICUs was relatively minimal. And I think that's reflected in uh, the patient population we've cared for and their, their average ages and functional status and allowed us to achieve uh, decent outcomes. And lastly, I wouldn't be, if I didn't talk about the, the way we approached uh, medical care, uh, we've, essentially, we've tried to, uh, in some ways, uh, ensure we had a robust medical model um, to support all aspects of patient care. In particular, I think uh, you know, a lot of my colleagues would uh, support that moving to the sessional model of payment for physicians has made a real impact in our ability to staff overnight call. I mean, I think the liter to me, the literature is quite clear that remuneration for after hours responsibilities is um, significantly associated with the lack of burnout. Uh, and that's allowed us to make sure we have ICU physicians present 24 seven at all three of our sites uh, and helps provide patient care, helps having those family conversations after hours, and has allowed us to become more efficient. 
uh, and also provide the detail focused care that's necessary at finely titrating ventilator pressures uh, and, and other aspects of care. Now that, that's been a significant um, uh, helper, I don't, not only the care, but I think in also allowing us to stay uh, healthy uh, and, and available to provide this care to our patients this deep into the pandemic. Uh, and lastly, um, as I was putting these slides together, I reached their thoughts uh, and memories from what the pandemic's been to them and what we've learned along the way. And, and I'll tell you what, what came back was not uh, stuff regarding uh, plateau pressures and driving pressures, but it was actually patient stories. And as I started to think about how to uh, put these together, and there was dozens of them, in fact, it was, it was really cool to reminisce about the patient sets. Uh, we cared for and their success and you know i'm sure we all have them whether you're working in windsor or sudbury or ottawa or at the other health network uh, we're all providing uh, uh, you know we all went into this to provide care to our patients and so uh, instead of putting those stories together in fact yesterday i got an email from uh, a patient's son and so this is may and she spent uh, uh, april into may with us over four weeks in the icu at our centenary site in the early part of wave one uh, and she reached out to our staff to provide a video and I've taken um, a clip of it. And I think uh, as we reflect on uh, where we've come in this pandemic and uh, knowing that the numbers looking ahead are uh, discouraging uh, to reflect back on what we've all accomplished and what, uh, what we've accomplished for our communities, I think is helpful. And so I'll just uh, let May say the last words. I wish I could see you all. Thank you personally, and maybe one day I'll get an opportunity to do that. But for now, I just want to say again, thank you so, so much. I'm ready to back to my Thank you. So with that, uh, happy to take questions. Dave, uh... I'm going to get over to you in just a sec. I'll remind people one more time that uh, that we're welcome to uh, to put some um, questions into the uh, into the chat, either on the YouTube channel or the uh, Zoom. Marty, thanks for, so much for uh, bringing Dr. Adhikari, our other uh, uh, planner for the uh, OC3PR. Um, Neil, well, couldn't join us today, but uh, you've been able to poke him quite nicely with his headset. So <laughs> well done. Well done. Dave, over to you. Yeah, no, uh, it, it, it's kind of a wow there, guys. You know, you've done a wonderful job. It's, uh, you know, it's a nice fitting end. Uh, that's kind of why we do what we do. Or it's, um, so it's nice to end with that. So I've got a lot of questions. I, I know Jose's man in, man in the, uh, the fort there for getting some questions, but I guess the question, I can only imagine the stress that this has put on your staff, um, be it nurses, physicians, but also your cleaners, your RTs, all the other support staff. So I was wondering how you've dealt with the highs and lows, um, some strategies you've come up with. And perhaps if you had one do-over, what would you have done differently? Um, so some words of wisdom that perhaps uh, Zelina and yourself, Marty, can share with, with uh, the people watching. Sure. Um, that's actually a great question. Uh, one of the things I have to say organizationally, we've, had, we've been blessed with having supports from our um, wellness coordinator. So we have a wellness coordinator that comes around to the units at least three times a week. Uh, we have debrief sessions, we have stretching, we have dancing, we have yoga, whatever it takes to really um, expel all the, the, the stress uh, that we accumulate. And these sessions are normally done at the nursing station and everybody is welcome to it. Um, we, from a resource perspective, we have um, a COVID task force team that meets in the first wave, um, they would meet three times a week. Uh, and now I believe they meet weekly. They come together and talk about the real issues, really the pebbles in their feet of what's bothering them. It's a task force that is comprised not only for nursing, it is a multidisciplinary team. And they're able to bring their questions and um, come up with solutions and it's supported uh, by leadership as well. And uh, in general, just having 
um, people around, uh, whether it's myself, the social worker, um, CPO, being able available to speak to the staff and individualize the attention we give them uh, in when they're in a crisis. Marty, anything to add? As, you know, from the physician side of the house, um, you know, making, you know, like anything, making sure people are supported. So in the early phases, it was really understanding PPE uh, so people could feel safe doing aerosolgenic procedure with your physician or nurse or an RT. And that was really important. I think people got comfortable with that. Uh, as Lena mentioned, as we moved into the, the second phase of the, the pandemic, uh, you know, we, we, we did so much heavy lifting in the early phases. Uh, now we're sort of um, moving on and what we're seeing is our, our volumes really eclipse what our hospital was and our, our staffing model was designed to accommodate. So as we move into models like the, uh, the Optiflow unit and team-based staffing, uh, really finding ways to engage people uh, uh, to uh, participate in the discussion and the decision-making around these units and, and to have some control of the, the way they approach care for their patients. Uh, and um, I think the last thing for me is, is maintaining grounding. Uh, so uh, being able to step away for a few minutes and, and uh, and spend time with family and, and so making sure people are not working longer and harder than they need to and, and looking forward to the summer <laughs> i'm sure you are um yeah, i remember you telling me you've never been cleaner with the number of showers that, that, that <laughs> you had taken and um i guess now in hindsight it was probably because you were dancing so uh zelina will be sure to post some uh, pictures of marty <laughs> dancing um Maybe we'll go to Jose and 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 uh, for some questions. And I know I have some others, but uh, I don't want to hog it up there. Jose, do you, do you want to present what some people have been asking? Absolutely. Thank you very much, and thank you, Martin and Zelina, for this presentation. Um, I think it's it's extremely impressive what you have accomplished over the months and how you've managed from wave one to wave two. And after all of that. And even in, in the middle of thing, you're bringing down, you're bringing it that back down. Sorry, that's my French coming out. You're bringing it down to, you know, the reason why we all do it, okay? Because we like to see those patients be able, being able to go back home. And that's the, the true reward of, of what we accomplish. So thank you for that. There has been a few questions coming my way, and uh, I would like to um, start a little bit with the topic of healthcare uh, worker safety. And there's a question about, have you had in your institution uh, healthcare worker uh, infections and has protecting them been drivers or a driver in developing some of your protocols? Hi. Um, so yes, in our second in the second wave, um, we did see uh, staff members acquire uh, the infection. Uh, a lot of it was community acquired. Um, and one of the things is we worked very, very closely with uh, IPAC as well as um, workplace health and safety to be able to identify to really do the tr uh, track and trace method um, to see uh, the extent uh, of which, um, staff or uh, patients would have been exposed and to be able to isolate uh, the staff members and be able to um, work backwards to see uh, the level of engagement that they had uh, and create resources. So one of the things is at the general site, we um, are challenged with space. It's an older building and even just having adequate um, lounge and break spaces, uh, maintaining social distancing and sitting uh, six feet apart. I think that has been very challenging, but we've tried to work uh, with uh, IPAC and um, Workplace Health and Safety to see how we can best support staff, ensuring that we have PPE at all times and, and just working in a way that's more meaningful to them um, and creating a safe environment. Thank you. Um, I would have another question as well. Um, you uh, were talking about the differences in timing of intubation from the fir first wave to the second wave being early, then late, then kind of latish. And I was curious to see how did you define this latish phase and did you use specific markers or scoring system 
uh, to allow um, that decision making? Sure, I can speak to that. So, um, you know, it's a little bit different in terms of the operations of uh, how we receive patients is that uh, so many more are coming to the ICU via our medical wards rather than coming directly from the emergency department. Uh, and so, you know, in the past you used to get the word about a patient crashing. Well, usually the patients with COVID, we can actually follow with our CCRT service to get alerted uh, hours, days, even in advance of them coming to the ICU. Uh, so most of our patients uh, will come to the ICU usually uh, on high flow nasal cannula uh, as a non-invasive respiratory support. Um, from the very beginning, uh, we, we've been using the ROCS index as a uh, guide uh, to help us, um, I think in two ways. One is to stratify patients in terms of how they're doing and, and two really as a communication tool. So, you know, when you're signing over uh, a dozen patients uh, outside of the ICU on OptiFlow, uh, you know, they can all look very similar. Uh, and so uh, being able to communicate the ROCS index of eight means something, uh, and it was seven yesterday, means something to me. Uh, and uh, when someone says the ROCS index went from six to three, I sort of get to, you, you worry about that patient. So we've used the ROCS index quite extensively as a, really as a guide, uh, uh, but has been uh, quite useful to it. And I think the secondary importance is that, you know, one of the, one of the, uh, three variables in the ROCS index is a respiratory rate. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if I've seen three accurately res recorded respiratory rates before March of last year. Uh, and it really puts an emphasis on that. And so whether the patient has COVID or whether they have, uh, you know, uh, decompensating as a CCRT patient without COVID on the floor, it, it's I think forces reflect on probably the most important vital sign uh, that exists for uh, a rapid response system. Uh, so, so we, as, you know, to answer your question, um, uh, Early on, we'd use the ROCS index, and as you know, the threshold of 4.88 after 18 hours is uh, what's considered a, a patient high risk of failing. And so we would have patients in the second phase of you know, ROCS index down to maybe two, two and a half, and we'd still, um, still try and maintain them <clears throat> that way. I think really what we're saying and moving to sort of the late, late-ish uh, intubation is that you know, patients that are on 100% uh, oxygen by nasal uh, cannula that's on a Tavish mask on top of that, and prone and not achieving and looking uncomfortable, like that's a patient that, that will intubate it uh, and, and do so quickly and, and maybe even in, in advance of getting that far. And so not letting patients run that, uh, that far down. Thank you. And I, I assume that fits very well into your respiratory unit in terms of like a continuum as you're following these patients uh, with your CCRT team and allow the transition from the respiratory unit to the ICU. Yeah, just to give you some background on the, the, the development of the high acuity respiratory unit. So my colleague, Kevin Shore has done certainly most of the legwork and background work at helping um, lead this, this effort. And it came out of an observation of our physicians that really because of the capacity reasons, uh, we were trying to rescue patients with uh, high flow nasal cannula, often off of uh, you know, a non-rebreather mask they've been on for days. And so, uh, you know, we believe quite strongly in the florally data uh, that shows that in uh, and hypoxemic respiratory failure. Uh, and I think their inclusion criteria was a PF ratio less than 300. Uh, there really are important outcome differences with patients managed on high flow versus conventional oxygen or, or non-invasive ventilation. You know, upwards of 20% uh, reduction in intubation and even half the mortality rate. So we recognize that um, we needed more capacity uh, to provide this therapy and that we needed to provide it earlier for patients, earlier in their course of illness. So. Um, uh, in addition, so uh, we've tried to use the, uh, the HRU as a way of selecting those patients earlier in the process of their illness, providing capacity. And as Lena mentioned, we're running this essentially as a level two uh, basic ICU where uh, the care is provided by an intensivist in a closed model uh, and supported by uh, medicine nurses uh, supplemented with critical care expertise by one of our critical care nurses. And, uh, we've been up and running for a, a little while now, and it's, it's worked quite well. Uh, the caveat to that is, as a three-site institution, uh, as we uh, sort of shuttle patients into that one particular site, uh, knowing that you know, roughly half the patients in that unit will ultimately need to be intubated, uh, uh, keeping residual critical care capacity at that site more than you would have otherwise is important because um, uh, there's, there's no place for them to go but, but down to the ICU afterwards in that circumstance. Thank you very much. Um, do we still have some time for more questions? I think we do, Jose. I, I just would want 
a quick question um, about that high acuity respiratory unit. So the slides fortuitous. What are the rooms? Like um, I would presume all of those rooms aren't negative pressure. Like, like it kind of goes full circle to the staff protection. Like what are the staff wearing? What are the type of rooms are they? And uh, um, and I'll, I just want clarification on conversion um, as well. So our ICUs have three negative pressure rooms each and we run 90 beds. So that's nine total negative pressure rooms. So we, we found that we rapidly ran out of negative pressure rooms to use high flow nasal cannula negative pressure exclusively. Um, and so we would commonly run it in a regular room with the door closed. Um, interestingly, uh, this, this particular ward uh, was constructed after SARS and has 18 negative pressure rooms on it. It's typically mothballed, actually, because it's not a great place to provide medicine care because no one ever has 18 patients needing negative pressure. So it's typically used in flu season. Um, so we've, uh, we've, we've, we've cordoned off 10 beds uh, of it. Um, this is a photo of it from earlier today. Uh, one of the challenges is because the patients are behind two doors uh, that you don't have direct line of sight into them. Uh, so as this picture illustrates, we've, um, we've employed a, an oximetry monitoring system. Um, uh, right now, it, uh, as you can see there, it's a, uh, there's a, a finger sensor a patient wear connected by Bluetooth to uh, a display unit directly at the door. It has an alarm you can hear down the hallway, so you don't have to be far away to see if the patient's desaturating. Uh, in the very near future, as soon as we can get the IT work done, uh, it'll transmit directly to a, a central monitoring station at the nurse's desk with appropriate alarms as well. Um, uh, is there more? To, I think there might have been more to your question, Dave. Yeah, right. no, the other was that uh, Zelina said that it was community acquired that you feel your staff got, or did, how many staff do you, you know, feel got infected? while working um, and uh, that was the only thing I didn't understand exactly. So in the second wave, uh, the um, when we had a community acquired, um, I think we were working with three staff that were affected. Um, and um, I believe in the first wave, the first wave, sorry, they did have um, some staff members who uh, were infected, but that was hospital acquired but we haven't seen that in the second wave. Okay. I think if you compared the, uh, the rate of COVID incidents in our community relative to our staff, uh, our community still is well in excess of what our frontline clinicians have experienced uh, day in and day out. We, we, as I mentioned, we have had at least more, more recently uh, a few uh, work related uh, cases, even in our physician group. Um, thankfully everyone's back to work uh, now. Um, but, uh, you know, comparing, we, we, we certainly uh, had a, um, the majority of the staff that were off were uh, community acquired cases. Okay. Jose? Yes, thank you. Um, there's, a, there's a few more. I don't think we'll have a chance to go through all of them, but um, there was uh, one question about um, how have you specifically addressed, um, because I know you, so you talked about supporting the staff, have you had some specifics on addressing staff burnout in your institution since you have been hit quite hard? Um, one of the things that we had promoted um, as we realized that we were short staffed as well as the burnout rate was getting higher during um, the, the holiday period close to December, um, generally where areas in other hospitals were kind of limiting the amount of, of time um, staff could be off just as the pandemic was, was really hitting us the hardest. We tried our hardest to provide staff with adequate time off, sometimes even in excess of the, um, the five days. Uh, that we normally go with the collective agreement. So as much as we could support staff on days where we knew we could be supported by um, other sources, agencies, or over time, we were able to work with giving time off to staff just so they could really rest and take some time off. So that was something we promoted very heavily where we were able to, um, to work around schedules, but obviously in a safe way where we were 
okay at work, but uh, people did get their time off. Thank you. Um, one last question, I think, uh, related to uh, RT. So um, you have presented models of team-based or team-based models for nurses and physician. And questions are, how have you uh, distributed the RTs across these different units? Uh, Go ahead, Marty. <laughs> so um, uh, the, the structure of our team-based model you know, includes um, uh, not just nursing, but includes, uh, um, in fact, different levels of nursing. So for instance, in the model that we're presenting here, uh, there's an expert critical care nurse. There are sub-expert critical care nurses. Those are individuals that have uh, some experience in critical care and there's, there's uh, non-expert critical care nurses, but it extends also into other shared resources, including uh, RTs, as you mentioned, social work, spiritual care, all the people that need to make an ICU uh, function effectively. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess one of our challenges has been, uh, we don't have RTs to bring in other areas. We've relied heavily on, um, you know, our, 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 our team-based nursing model relies heavily on uh, pulling from uh, surgical programs as we adjust the types of cases that are being done and the amount of surgery that's being done. But similarly, we know RTs and anesthesia assistants help support uh, some ORs as well. And so uh, these individuals have been brought into the pool uh, to make sure that we're well resourced and staffed, and and part of our activity too, um, if I can speak to the you know the high, uh, high acuity respiratory unit, is to start to cohort patients with similar illnesses to particular wards, so that if you're a respiratory therapist, you're not having to go to six wards to see all the patients on high flow oxygen. You can actually uh, uh, focus on one particular area. So, uh, in some ways. While the volume of patients is increasing, what we're trying to do is to concentrate it so that we can actually uh, get the resources to where the patients are in an efficient and effective way. And so that's been our strategy for the RTs. And I wish we had more of them. Thank you very much. All excellent uh, questions. And I think there was a quick one for you guys. Um, ha what is the longest time a patient has been prone at your institution? So the one patient that comes to mind, so, I mean, 20 hours uh, consecutively, but, um, you know, we certainly, you know, just to, to give, to not give up hope on certain patients. I do recall a patient from uh, uh, late summer, uh, early fall. He was a gentleman of 62, uh, otherwise healthy with a, you know, a couple trivial medical problems uh, that became profoundly, profoundly ill. And, um, uh, my colleague, Chris Lozongos, was in touch with uh, Margaret Harridge and Neil Ferguson at Toronto General about transferring the patient for ECMO, and he was accepted. Uh, and then when the EMS, uh, the Orange Ambulance folks came up, uh, he was too sick for them to transfer. I think his saturation was from the 70, high 70s and prone position, and he was a renal failure on dialysis and everything you had done, pulmonary vasodilators. Um, but... Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember how long we persisted with prone position ventilation, but uh, certainly it was, it was uh, measured in weeks. Um, and uh, he left the ICU, he walked out of here. Uh, it took uh, a month to get him out of the ICU from that date, uh, but um, uh, certainly, uh, you know, someone that was given up on, so to speak, or, or uh, it still can get better. And so that's, uh, and, it, and it just takes, patience and time and, and diligent care. And that's, uh, that was his success. That is very inspiring. So thank you very much. Uh, to you, Dave, or, or, or Michael. Well, I think that is a fitting way to end it. Um, nice to end on a nice success story there, uh, Marty. Um, so I, I think uh, all of us are, are impressed. We'll what you've done and what you are doing. And I'm sure if, if sites have questions that they would want to get more specifics that uh, um, you'd be okay receiving correspondences, uh, both you and, and uh, Zelina. The, uh, just again, a reminder um, from Maria is, is to please fill out the survey. Um, certainly we welcome that uh, feedback and suggestions. Uh, Marty and Zelina, I just want to say thanks. I, I will leave the final words to our senior statesman, uh, Dr. Sullivan, please take us home. Thanks, Dave. Um, 
Martin, Lena, we honestly just can't thank you enough. I know that uh, this was, I think, everything I'd hoped for, mainly because not only did we find out the nuts and bolts of what you're doing, but it's the, you know, it's the inspiration of your work. That's, uh, I think, most people are going to be taken away from this and, and just your willingness to keep finding ways to stay ahead. Clearly, we've had some you know, sobering news today from, uh, from our modelers. Um, it'll be many more of our ICUs will be facing the kind of challenges that you have had to face already. Um, and I think the way that you've uh, managed this, particularly this idea of, as I say, trying to stay out and stay ahead, um, finding ways to be able to support your staff uh, in particular uh, are, uh, are really important. Marty, I got a note in the, uh, in the uh, YouTube chat, just talking about the fact that they're, they're one of your colleagues feels that their most significant asset was their superhuman leadership from, a, from their medical director. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a really, really important piece for us to imagine over this next little while. Uh, you know, the uh, finding a way for all of us to, uh, to stay optimistic and to, and, to, and to want to keep finding our way through this, just like your patient who was in, you know, some dark hours and got better. Um, you know, that's, I think that's going to be accessible for us as a system and we're going to want to try and hold together. And certainly this part of this, the, the purpose of these rounds, um, the slide in front of you will tell you that our next rounds are going to be, uh, you know, we've got a short turnaround time for that. We're going to have a, I think what's going to be a pretty timely topic on, uh, on COVID-19 vaccines, what, who, where, when we, uh, skipped the why, because that seemed to be self-evident. And uh, we're going to have a, a, just a look at what the landscape is in Ontario. So uh, thanks to everybody who joined us today and, uh, and uh, good luck getting back to your work. Marty and Zelina, we'll probably just get you to stay on for a minute, okay? Goodbye, everybody else.